Pickaxe. Hello and welcome back to the Review of Death, a Doctor Who podcast and your fortnightly home for Doctor Who news and reviews. I'm Matthew Toffolo and I'm joined as ever by Billy Garrett John. Hello, Billy. Merry Christmas, sort of. It's Christmas! That's what it is. And I am absolutely baking in this office. It is so hot in Auckland. It's like still 24 degrees and it's 10 past nine in the evening wow holy shit i mean i'm fru- and this my room ass is off. just been cooking all day and i'm now sat in it with everything shut because the bugs in this country are fucking mental right? Any lights that they find they will make a beeline for stealth found a spider in this office about that big a couple of months ago Wow. It was like a, it was a, it was a huntsman basically shit so did she did she remove it and then tell you no, so I got back and then she started like looking at me weirdly and pointing and shooting like electric bolts from her fingers and then I realised it was stuck to her back. So, <laughs> you know, that was a bit freaky. Um, yeah, I no, wondered uh, where you were going with that at first. I was like, what's the channel about? <laughs> no, that was just a, that was a heavy night. So, uh, yes, Merry Christmas, everybody. Of course, this is not the only Christmas coverage you're going to get from the Review of Death towards no. the end of December because we have the church on Ruby Road coming yeah. on the 25th. So keep an eye out on social media for when our review of that drops uh, because we're still kind of working out times and stuff, yeah. but we'll let you know. It's awkward because um, it's, it's Christmas, isn't it? And everyone's all exactly. over the place in, at Christmas. So uh, it's going to be a tricky one, but we will we will endeavour to get it out ASAP. Um, and obviously we'll probably be too full of food and drunk on Christmas Day to really talk about Doctor Who. I think that's probably the best time to talk about Doctor Who because at least you're honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that Janice Goblin. Whoa, I tell you what. Um, I'd fill her stock in. Okay. Jesus uh, Christ. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. Uh, it is uh, time for us to talk about an episode of Doctor Who that we've already reviewed, Matthew, on yes. uh, your YouTube channel. Yeah. And on the Rod of Old. It- the rod of old uh, in the old black scrolls yeah uh, we talked about this um i would not encourage anybody to go back and watch it because well maybe because the the, the views i think might be slightly different at least on my end uh but <laughs> you know we don't stand by anything we said back then uh, no. it is not uh rod limited does not sign off on that yeah it's, it's not representative it's, it's, it's not canon anymore <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. No, 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 no. After the reboot um, of, of this podcast, anything, anything before? After the the bi regeneration of Rod, where we split <laughs> yeah. into the podcast form. Yeah, um, yeah. That that's not canon anymore. So um, we are talking about the husbands of River Song, the 2015 Christmas yeah. special. Is, um, is is there any news? Have we got any news to talk about in the meantime? Doctor oh, the Who's Sonic on this weekend. We oh have, yeah, the new we Sonic. We haven't talked about the Sonic Screwdriver. Let's talk about that. Because obviously this story, okay. the Husbands of River Song, also kind of debuted um, the new Sonic Screwdriver for Peter Capaldi. He gets it at the end of Hellbent, doesn't he? Husbands of River Song has four different fucking Sonic devices in it, which we'll get to. But four? Don't think really? about it too hard. Oh, yeah, okay. it does. Interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I like the new Sonic because it's nice to see a departure from a dentist's implement, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily sold on the shape. I gotta say, but I do think that it will make a good toy because you know when he was showing off the prop, and was like, "Oh, this comes out and this does this," and you know you can slide it round like a flip phone or whatever. I think all that stuff for a toy, I think that's going to be really cool. Um, and you know, especially in this era of all children have got ADHD. And they're all fidget spinners and all this kind of shit. So, oh you know, yeah, they're, it's you know it's it's going to be good. You know, schools everywhere they'll be like, oh, little 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 Barry over here, he can't concentrate. <laughs> have a go on this Sonic Matt, screwdriver. <laughs> no children have been born in the last fifteen years that are called Barry. Let's well, just be honest gonna, with ourselves. I was going to like. say little <laughs> Billy, but then I thought, wait, you are Billy, so that's just going to confuse people. Um, and Barry, it's, for yeah. some reason, was the first thing that came to my <laughs> Barry. head. Barry. <laughs> oh, my God. It's 1968. 
Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I. I. Oh my god! This chair always catches me by surprise. I. Um. I like the Sonic. That yeah. is gonna sell like hotcakes at Christmas. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. I guess we'll just have to wait and see when it comes out. I got a funny feeling because nothing's been. You know, like when the Fourteenth Doctor Sonic Screwdriver was announced. You know, the next day or something, wasn't it? You could pre-order the toy. So I reckon. Yeah. I wonder if because this is just the Christmas special, I wonder if they've sort of said, well, why don't we like launch all the merchandise for when the series comes out or like just before the series yeah. comes out? I think that makes more sense because I know some people are like, well, where's our shooty Gatwa figure and where's our this, that and the other? And as nice as it would be to have all of those things, I think if they want to do a big publicity launch with merch and everything else, it makes more sense to do it in the new year before the series comes on for eight episodes and not just do it right before Christmas. And obviously people have bought their Christmas presents, you know? You can't, I, I can't mm. imagine, you know, little Barry turning around to his mum and dad and going, <laughs> mum and your daddy, I want the new Doctor Who Sonic screwdriver. Oh yes, how much is that? 30 quid. Fuck off, we've already bought your presents, you little shit. Fuck off, Barry. <laughs> um, if you're a uh, rodder and you're called Barry, we greatly apologise, but, you know, it's your yeah. fault. <laughs> so, uh, I, I reckon it's that. I reckon that's probably the reason why. I, I, I'm just flabbergasted we don't have a Meep in time for Christmas. I know, I, I am disappointed that there are no, there is no or Meep merch. like, a 14th Doctor uh, uh, not thing stretch armstrong where you can drop his jaw down oh my god that would be amazing that would be so good <laughs> hire me character options yeah i'm here all year <laughs> very good no i like that um yeah so i guess we'll just see on the merch stuff it's it's gonna come eventually but I, you know, pe yes. you know what people are like they want it here they want it now and i think you've said already there's probably a bit of hesitancy from retailers. Yeah, 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 yeah. About stocking their shelves with stuff because, um, you know, it, it became increasingly difficult for them to shift stock Definitely. Uh, towards yeah. the end of the Chibnall era or during or whatever. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, Doctor Who as a brand in terms of merchandise, yeah, it became something of a, a dead weight, really. I, I think after, I, I, you can sort of see it in the Matt Smith era, starting to trickle off. I think after the 50th, because there was just so much stuff, you know, everyone wanted a piece of that pie. You know, you could get Doctor Who anything. And then I think once Capaldi came along and his launch wasn't quite the success that I guess people hoped it would be. And then I think when Jodie was announced, everyone was like, oh, okay, well, this is a chance for a fresh start. We'll take a punt again. And then that wasn't quite the success that people expected it to be. Um, I mean, you know, is we would be we would be lying if we said, you know, why did the BBC books range stop? You know, because they just weren't shifting. Yeah. You know, um, for for you know, with her doctor, uh, and you know, obviously, character tried a big push with a full wave of figures and all this kind of stuff, and you know, then that disappeared subsequently. So uh, yeah, I think retailers are probably quite hesitant to back the Doctor Who horse until they've seen, oh, actually, you know, people really are watching this and people really are interested in buying the stuff. Um, so we'll I think see. it's the international market that's going to help them yeah. come to that conclusion because yeah. we are now starting to see promotion for Doctor Who uh, on Disney Plus in Australia yeah, um, and out in the public in the United Kingdom, of course. But um, yeah. it is starting to get that reach. And yeah. I think it's starting to get that buzz. Um, and so once they realise that it's not just localised to B&Ms and Coventry, um, well, that's it. and actually, you know, we can go into stores all over the world, um, that will be when stuff starts to pick up. So, you know, I see a lot of people talking about character and sort of being negative about lack of this figure, lack of that figure. Yeah. Um, maybe if the show becomes huge internationally, yeah. Would it be time for, I'm not saying that it would happen or they would be interested, but a Mattel or a Hasbro to pick up that license? Do you think that's possible? I don't know. Possibly Hasbro. I don't know if, because Hasbro, Hasbro, I think, have got more of, they've got more of the big IPs, you know, they've got Star Wars, they've got all the Marvel stuff. Um, 
I uh, so maybe, um, but I think I think if that were to happen and there were to there was to be a sudden explosion, you know, and the character were like, oh, actually, you know, we can we can make money and then we can put that money back into tooling lots of different things. Um, then I don't see why character wouldn't just be like, well, we'll just jump on board and and, and up the ante. Um, I mean, the passion to make the stuff is there. You know, we've had Al on here and he's keen to do stuff. Um, you know, and I've heard him on other podcasts, you know, sort of reminiscing about the the, the good old days. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know, really. I just think, and obviously the other big thing which people seem to forget is that the the whole retail market for figures and stuff is so different now compared to where it was, you know, we're going back nearly 20 years. Um, I think people sure. seem to forget that. Um, you know, so many of you know, like Woolworths is gone. Toys R Us is gone. Um, the entertainer, they can be quite particular about the sort of stuff that they stock. So yeah, it's it's difficult, really. Um, the landscape it's is very It's an interesting different. market here because I feel like it might be more akin to the States where you have racks of toys. Do you know what yeah. I mean? In, in like sort of not supermarkets, but the yeah. equivalent of a Wilco. So yeah. out here we have, the warehouse yeah. or the, the, the what 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 if funny and it's shelves of stuff and I was going in and I thought actually some of this stuff is really neat like they have these sort of throwback Star Trek action figures that have oh, card yeah. backing yeah and that stuff I, I don't know if it's appealing to little Barry yeah but it's cool looking mm. you know and of course you know Nerf guns everywhere maybe yeah. stuff like play sets Tardises Sonic screwdrivers is a route into the action figure range yeah. blossoming again because yeah. kids want stuff with bells and whistles and yeah. um, you know AR integration on their mobile phones. Yeah. So maybe that's a route for the the series to go. Well, this is it. Like Annie and I watched, uh, we watched Trixie Mattel going through the uh, the hottest toys of Christmas 2023, and it was crazy watching it because all of it was like. AI stuff, you know, it was like Furbies and things and they all talked and they all, you know, there was all this interaction stuff. But as for like, you know, the, the, there was not like an action figure as the hot toy or, you know, anything like that. Mm. It was all this kind of technological stuff. So I think that's the other thing is that people forget that in order to, in order for a toy line to be successful, you know, we need parents buying it for kids it's, you know, I, I know they people turn around and say, oh, but they'd sell loads because the 50 of us on Twitter who have said we'd want a Sasha Dewan master will buy it. But unfortunately, those 50 people aren't enough to finance the tooling and all that sort of stuff. So I think, yeah, the action figure stuff is very much a collector's domain. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the most It's part. clear when you look at the fact that, you know, all of the stuff that's come out with the exception of B&M over the last, what, two years or something has been the character yeah. online exclusives. And even yeah. the stuff that's come out in B&M has got that seal on it, collector's edition. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's being traded on a bit like when Doctor Who was off the air and Doctor Very Who became so. a kitsch item, like you'd get a talking Dalek for your dad because he watched that weird show when he was a kid. Yeah. Um, or a Dalek apron or a Davros commemorative plate or whatever the fuck. Yeah, um, exactly. And I mean, going back to what you said about seeing Star Trek in um, in the shops over there, um, Playmates, who just got the, the license to do Star Trek figures from across, you know, all of the different series, they made an announcement the other day. They did two waves, I think, last year, and they've dropped it. They've said they're not selling enough. So, you know, you think a big thing like Star Trek, which has got so many series going out at the moment. You know, it's not just one series. They've got animated stuff. They've got other spin-offs and things, you know, which is obviously what Doctor Who is trying to do. Doctor Who is trying to follow that format at the moment. You know, if they can't shift stuff, then bloody hell, what, what hope has Doctor Who got? So I think things like that people need to bear in mind. I know people obviously were going to listen to this and say, well, that's Star Trek. That's not Doctor Who. You know, Doctor Who's much better or whatever. Um, but I think you just need to realise that it's all cut from the same cloth and there is just a shift going on. Um, you know, you just need to be aware that things ain't what they used to be. Ain't that the truth? Um, one thing I think that did hamper merchandise, you know, years ago 
was the whole thing of split seasons and that did not help, the show yeah. being off the air for 12 months at a time unless you were watching class and who the fuck was watching class. So <laughs> uh, that brings us nicely on to December you mean, the 25th. You mean character options didn't release a figure of a PE teacher that you could pull the dragon out of his anus? <laughs> But that's at least interactive. That's a nice playset. Well, that puts well, me in the mind of that Jabba the Hutt that g- oozed goo. Yeah, yeah, with the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, one of the hot toys this year is a monkey that shits itself and then you fling its shit at people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> we we could have had that. Shitting out a dragon oh. or whatever it is. Um <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Oh, man. Oh, God, it's so hot in here. Right. Uh, 25th of December, 2015, Matt. This yeah. was the last episode of Doctor Who to come out until the next Christmas special, December 25th, 2016, with the exception, of course, of the introducing As Bill um, <laughs> yeah. thing that happened. Was that Children in Need or Comic Relief that year? Uh, I can't remember. I, why do I feel like it was like after the football? Or between the football, just before the football was about to start. You're right. Or was it badminton or uh, well, badminton, fucking Wimbledon or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it was something like that, wasn't it? Bonkers. I- um, yeah, so this was the last TV story. The Husbands of River Song, by the way, is what we're talking about today. Uh, yeah. Before the dreaded production break of 2016. Um, at, just to give you a bit of context, at the time... Private Eye reported, BBC staff have recently been informed that showrunner Stephen Moffat's commitments to his other hit show, Sherlock, mean there will be no full series of Doctor Who in 2016. I think, wasn't there some excuse given at the time, or maybe that was for series 7B and A being split, that the BBC were like, there's just so much content this year. We just can't fit Doctor Who into our schedule. I think that was, I think that was series, I think that was under Matt Smith. The, yeah, was that around the time of the Olympics? There was the Olympics going on, and they were like, "Oh, you know, we want we want Doctor Who to get the the limelight. You know, we didn't want it being shared between that and the Olympics." It was really weird. It was like such a bullshit excuse, <laughs> <laughs> such a bullshit excuse for like we haven't got any scripts yet. <laughs> the scripts aren't ready in time. <laughs> Christ almighty, I cannot wait for the collection. (laughs) Well, uh, yes, apparently, uh, rumour has it. Can't wait for the collection set spread that season. Um, Yes, so we have reviewed this story already, as we said Mm -hmm. earlier. Um, Yeah. But before watching, Matt, what did you remember of the story and what were your expectations going back into it again? I'm guessing for the (sighs) first time since the initial broadcast. Um, no, actually, I've watched it since then because I, I watched it, I wow. caught up when I was doing my big Doctor Who run through. Um, it took so long to do that Peter, Peter Capaldi sort of almost came and went. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so I did, I did watch it again then, I think. But, um, yeah, I mean, if you have watched the old video, you, you will know that I was not enamoured with this story by any means. Um, so when, you, I mean, obviously if you watched the last episode, if you watched our review of the giggle and saw at the end, Billy telling me we were doing the husbands of river song, my reaction will have been enough to, to gauge exactly how I felt about this story. This has been uh, a long time coming. Cause I'm sure when we were recording in the studio back in Bristol, I told you and your yeah, reaction was the same. Yeah. We were, we've been talking about this for a while and I, I, I actually knew what was coming when you were saying it. I was like, Oh, he's going to say husbands of river song. But I was, I was kind of hoping you'd maybe forgotten. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's not a story that I was ever particularly fond of, but I'm going to be honest, although I was sort of a bit hesitant to watch it and I was like, oh, do I have to? I did sit down, uh, you know, Annie and I sat down to watch it and she was really up for it. She quite likes the story. And I thought, well, look, I, I will try and go in with a, a fresh perspective and, you know, Jonathan's not here either. So it's not like he's, yeah, he's not going to inform you. He's not there going, God, this is so stupid. Oh, you know, <laughs> doing all that sort of stuff. So I thought that I'm in a, I'm in a safe environment. Um, but unfortunately, even that was not enough to tempt me over uh, because I still came out at the end thinking, oh, it's just, it's just not my, my type of Doctor Who. I think that's it. It's just, it's, Annie said, oh, it's, it's a bit like, she said, imagine it's like a pantomime. And I said, yeah, 
That's the problem. Mm. I don't like pantomimes. And although <laughs> I understand the, you know, I understand what she was trying to say. Um, and I know a lot of the delivery, particularly at the start, because the start is all um, very farcical. You know, the whole beginning of those stories are farce. It's only really until you get to the final act do things get sort of serious. Um, but you, I feel like even the actors, not Peter so much, but I definitely think Alex Kingston is sort of sending it up a little bit, you know, and the whole the whole gag that she doesn't realise it's the Doctor, which is so dopey because it's so obviously him, you know, you don't need to be a freaking <laughs> rocket scientist. Who else dresses like that? Come on. Exactly. That's it. And I think that's what we said last time. No one else wears a, a lovely velvet coat like that. Um, yeah. On so- the velvet coat, though. I don't. It didn't pop on screen like I remember it doing because a lot of that is is quite low light. It's very low light, so, isn't it? Yeah, especially in the dining stuff in towards the end of the story. Yeah, and then of course he changes out for like the the biggest scene of the entire episode at the end. Yeah, um, into that bonkers costume. What was it with cravats and dressing like a fucking undertaker? He does I the same know. thing on uh, Mummy and the Orient Express, and yeah, yeah, and it doesn't. It's not a really a look for him. He's like he no. looked. He looked so good. He's so striking in the in the in the slimmer fit, crumby coat. Yeah, the it ruins the silhouette. Yeah, you know? he looks. He looks sort of boxy. He looks like he's mm. stolen another man's clothes because it just doesn't <laughs> look like it fits him very well. Um, so You're yeah, right. that's weird. And I mean, I guess the cravat maybe he was like, I want to be like John Pertwee, uh, and they were like, Well, all right then. Um, but it is. That, can yeah, that we is get weird. your Can we get your best Peter Capaldi impression, please? Uh, oh no, <laughs> no, I can't do. A, I can't do a Peter Capaldi. Oh no, by the way, um, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, uh, yeah, I, well, I'm not totally shocked that you came out of it with the same impression. But yeah, were there elements I mean, of it that you enjoyed more this time for whatever reason, or things that you probably went? Oh, it's bloody stupid when you were watching it back in the day. That you actually uh, thought, go on then. Um let me let me quickly skim my notes. Uh I mean there's little little bits and bobs that I that I appreciated. You know, I appreciate the little reference with all the doctors. That's nice fun. Um I love, you know, the Harmony Shoal thing when the guy pulls his head apart. That is such a gruesome thing, especially to have on Christmas Day. Um, that's a real cool image. And that was great. Um, and I think really the the one, my biggest takeaway from rewatching this was, wasn't Peter Capaldi such a superb doctor? Even doing there the is... humorous stuff, he's just, he, he manages to just balance it all on so many levels. He's brilliant. There is something, I think I've said it before, there is something cosmic about yeah. Peter Capaldi's performance as yeah. the Doctor. It's, and I think I've said this before, it's Bowie-esque. Mm. Just the way he holds himself, he is from somewhere yeah. else. I don't know if that means that Scots are just predisposed to playing Doctor Who, because it seems <laughs> like all the best Doctors, <clears throat> fingers crossed for Shooty, come yeah. from up there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, from up the road. I, I'm going to come out and say it. I really, really enjoyed the Husbands of River Song. Wow. <laughs> and I, I'm actually shocked those words are coming out of my mouth. <laughs> but there was a point, and I think it was, I'm trying to remember exactly, oh, it was when Matt Lucas first had his head put on the top of the robot. Yeah. And they started marching out. And I just went, oh God, I'm, I'm liking this. <laughs> and it took me by surprise. But yeah. as you said, I think the thing that sells it, you know, there's daft panto stuff kind of going on in the background. But if you take it as the Doctor sailing through this bonkers, bizarre, he's co- he coasts through this story all the way. He doesn't really have any influence on what's going on at all. Yeah. It's like, yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's a terrible analogy, but, you know, it's a kind of a Buster Keaton almost, you know, he's on a conveyor belt going through all yeah. these bonkers things that are happening around him. And, and it's everybody like one referring set piece to the to do- another, isn't it? Exactly. And yeah. everyone referring to the doctor as a an entity off screen and obviously yeah. all the stuff with River which culminates in that really fantastic scene where she talks about how loving him is like loving yeah. the stars and it's you know you can't expect a sunset to admire you back yeah. and all that. 
I, I I absolutely, I, I will say there were things that I still have an issue with, which we'll get right. to. Yeah. But I can park those things because they were flashes of red hot anger that I got <laughs> <laughs> rather than like a persistent, you know, yeah. begrudging of what I was watching, which I think, yeah. you know, this is the second time I've watched this story. Right. So for me, it was almost like watching old Doctor Who for the first time. You know, okay. it, I'm far enough removed from who I was then and the issues that I had with the show and probably the way that I voiced them yeah. online, on Twitter, on YouTube, whatever. And I just look at it now, removed from all of that. And maybe an encouragement in myself to be part of like a, oh, the Moffat bandwagon sucks, you know. Yeah. And, I, and I know I've been guilty of doing that on this podcast since we restarted <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the whole Rod thing. But uh, man, I really enjoyed it. Oh, well, um, that's, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's a Christmas one, miracle, Matthew. It really is. It really is. And Well, I mean, I'm glad one of us enjoyed it. You know, it would have been... Let's go through the things that we liked, though, because I think I could maybe... We could maybe have a bit of a ghost of Christmas past thing going on here. Yeah. I could maybe turn that, that Scrooge persona <laughs> into something a bit lighter and fluffier. So you talked about Peter Capaldi. I'm going to go through... <laughs> I've got bullet points... <laughs> I've got bullet points of the things that I loved him doing. First of all, his face when he first sees River Song. Yeah. Beautiful grin on his face. You don't need any dialogue to tell you the way he feels about her. Um, Nardole telling him not to cross his arms. You know, I've got oh, cross yeah, that, arms. All that's, that a stuff. Great, that's a great line. I, I like that. Yeah. And uh, don't make puddles was a great line when he, <laughs> yeah, Nardole yeah. realises he's not the surgeon. Um, yeah. Over-egging his reaction to the TARDIS interior. Yeah. That's when good. he's like, this is my turn. I get to do this now. And he yeah. goes in and is, you know, oh, my brain can't compute what I'm seeing here. You know, yeah, all yeah. that is just magic. I loved it. Slightly, slightly overbaked by Murray, I think. Especially towards the end where, yeah. you know, the kind of da -da 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 flourish at the end of that scene like it was yeah. a fucking comic routine. And it's like, you know, I, I maybe we don't need a massive, you know, flourish to end that segment i found that for this whole story is that it is very it, it the, the scoring feels like a cartoon you know it feels like a looney tunes or a tom and jerry where everything has got underscoring and like you said you know that da -da -da -da, you know it, it feels like that like when they're running you know it almost feels like he's on the xylophone going yeah all this kind of stuff um so yeah it has a, it does have that element of it um but then again, you know, when we get to the end and the sort of story, mm. we've, you know, we've parked, we've parked the main plot and we can get into the character stuff, which is where this story works, I would say, you know, the, you know, as someone who does not like River Song generally as a character. Same. Um, yeah. You know, so, I mean, I've never, <sighs> that's part of the problem as well, is that whenever I see that it's a story centric to her, I sort of go, but like, oh, but um you know, they did a really good job, I think, of tying it all together because this is this is meant to be her penultimate appearance, isn't it, before dying in Silence of the Library. Um, yeah. So it was. It, it does work well how they tie it all together and, you know, the stuff with her diary and that the diary is nearly full up and, she, you know, all that stuff about, well, the, the man who gave it to me would know how long a diary you would need and all this kind of stuff. It, Fantastic it's great. Line. And, you know, and getting the sonic screwdriver... Um, Oh, yes, of course. So that's what you mean when you said there's four sonic devices in it. I forgot he gives her that one as well. So that's his yeah, sonic, got her sonic. His sonic, the future sonic, the sonic sunglasses and the sonic trowel. Oh, yes, the sonic sunglasses as well. Yeah, I did sort of wince a bit when he put those on. Um, I thought oh, I know. I'd, for I'd forgotten about those. Um, Do you remember Peter's whole thing about designing that costume? Not the hmm. one that we see here, obviously, but the one that we saw in the 100% Rebel Time Lord photos from yeah, the initial... Yeah series eight thing was I want kids to be able to get this costume together easily. And it's like, yeah. bro, you are dripping. Like <laughs> yeah. your outfit is tens of thousands of pounds. And then to top it all off, I know you could probably get a cheap pair down H and M or down Primark or whatever. Yeah. But then you've got the flashiest Ray bands and their sonic yeah. devices on you. I, I mean, I love it. I suppose it's cheaper to do that than to go down Toys R Us and get the over designed, ugly blue sonic screwdriver. Yeah. Um, 
But so he gets that at the end of Hellbent, right? And this is the first time we see it in action. This is the first time we see him actually use it. And he only uses it briefly, doesn't he? I think he just uses it at the end when the ship's crashing. Um, yes. And that's a, you know, that's a very Stephen Moffat idea as well, isn't it? The ship, that the the, the ship is, uh, you've got to have killed people and all this sort of stuff to get passage on this ship. Um and, and 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 that's fine, and I and I think that the production design there, in terms of like the aliens, is quite good because although they're just aliens in suits, you know the mandibles and things, it, it works. You know, um, whoever's playing Fleming, I think is great because yes, it, the, the the blue one, like what I think I just wrote down blue cunt in my notes because <laughs> he's because he sells them out. Yeah, you know, yeah, oh, he's you a right bastard, shit, and it? he's real real shit. And then he tries to sell the doctor's head. Yeah, it's very you know Morbius vibes there. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of other lines uh, that I really liked from Cap. It was um, in the TARDIS <clears throat> when they have Hydroflax's head uh, in a bag. And I loved all that stuff with the, the head in the bag. Yeah. Um, was, uh, you can't shoot the head in the face. was yeah. a lovely line in isolation. Um, and all the stuff with Scratch from the Harmony Shoal group, yeah. uh, where obviously he pulls his head across. I completely forgot that they came back Literally in the, the next, next story, yeah. But nice how thing. he actually tied that together. Yeah, like when we watched it, or when we went onto iPlayer to watch it, and he saw that uh, Return of Doctor Mysterio was the next one, and she was like, "Wait, there's two Christmas specials on the trot." Mm. I said, "Yeah," and she was like, "What?" Were, she said, "Well, yeah, there was no series, was there, between those two?" I said, "No," and she was like, "Wow, that's like quite a quite an interesting mm. run of stories to have." Husbands of River Song, which is obviously, like I said, quite farcical. And then you've got uh, Doctor Mysterio, which again... That's next Christmas, Matt. Oh, no, please, because that's also shite. I can't, <laughs> I can't do it. You know, I love superheroes. I said this last time. I love superheroes, but Doctor Who and superheroes, they shouldn't be meeting, man. That is just... That is not a match made in heaven. That is a match made in Satan. <laughs> Let's talk about a match made in heaven. So let's talk a bit about River Song. You, you mentioned that you're not a fan, and yeah. I get that. I'm not overly a fan. Well, well I think the. Th I mean, the thing is, I liked her to begin with. I liked her yeah. in Science of the Library. I remember at the time being a bit hesitant when they were trying to suggest that the Doctor was married to her, and I was like, "What is this madness?" Um, but I liked her in the Angels story and Pandorica. But it was from Series Six that I, you know, when. The, all of a sudden, she was always in it, and it was all this thing, and I was just like, oh. I mean, I know she's not really always in series six, but was she so integral to that that the, the long term plot, booking, that, isn't she? That, that whole, you know, the Melody Pond thing, and you know, that, that was she's obvious. the astronaut, yeah, and then she's the astronaut, and you know, I have seen the wedding of River Song probably three times. I could not tell you here and now what that story is about. All I well, know just is as well, that, Matt, because we are doing it next year. Are we? Well, there we go. Um, you know, because all I know is that the Doctor dies, but he's definitely not a robot. Turns out to be a robot. I mean, I love that. <laughs> I love Stephen Moffat. Was like, you know, it's not. We've not cheated you or anything. He's he's not going to be a robot or anything. And then he turns out to be a fucking robot. Um, but he's like, well, I guess he's probably thinking, ah, well, he's a little wee man in a robot, so it's not quite the same. <laughs> Um, was, it, was it Sylvester McCoy the showrunner at that point well, yes he was yeah <laughs> and there's a Rui robot um, yeah so okay. I, I, I yeah I, I agree with you River Song as a concept I like but River Song in execution, in execution yeah I'm not a huge fan of um, and I think that some of those aspects again they're really the only bits that ended up in the list of things I didn't like uh, was and it took me back to sort of lines of dialogue of hers. Probably the first time I was like, oh, I don't, don't, I don't know if I like her or the way that she's written was yeah. in uh, The Impossible Astronaut, the whole thing about her being a screamer. And then, oh, yeah. you know, in, in this one, there's uh, the Doctor saying, what do you think about his new appearance? And she's like, well, I've only seen the face. And it's like, yeah. all right, fucking hell. Yes. Doctor Who is so horny at this period in time. Jesus yeah. Christ. Um, it, it needs to get a room to itself. I'm, you know, I'm not a prude and I'm not being sort of overly sensitive, <laughs> I don't think. But all that stuff that she says about um, the doctor when, he, when he's formulating a plan and she's like, you're thinking, stop oh, doing that. 
you know, you're a man. It looks, it looks weird yeah. when you think. Oh, it's like, I, fuck off. I, like, I hate that line. No one speaks like that. <laughs> yeah. you know, again, that's that classic Stephen thing we always just say. is like, no human <laughs> being has ever said that like yeah. that. I know that she's from somewhere else and this is a science fiction series, but fuck off with that sort of shit. I find it really odd when you make the doctor this the most important person in the universe that was sort of steven's thing for a while was yeah. um you know the doctor uh is the center of everything and mm-hmm. uh it, it is the universe and all that um but then you have lines like but the doctor lies and it's like oh that's yeah. very nice um or oh, the doctor's this the doctor's that at, at many of these kind of junctions there is an effort made to kneecap the doctor Bring him down a level. But yeah. I don't think you do it by doing lines of dialogue like that because the Doctor isn't just a bloke. No. You know? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I mean, we both, when we were watching it, we all, we both went when that line came out because it, it it just feels unnecessary. And, you know, it's still present today. It's, we had the same thing with the Star Beast when, you know, that whole... This is something a male-presenting Time Lord wouldn't understand. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? Like, what... Who is that for? You know, who who is actually finding that funny? You know, and what what is what's really the gag there? You know, I know there's a there's a room of people going yes like that. Yeah, you know, and it's like yeah. okay, oh, great. <laughs> oh god, don't. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah. fair play if that honestly if that if that was like I don't I, yeah it's it's not alienating because then you can't you can't say alienating because that's like okay uh, cis het white males have owned that show yeah. in the fandom since yeah. time immemorial. So yeah. you can't really get that pissy about it because it's just like, well, it's just another perspective or like another kind of another vibe for the show. But it does just feel like, what? what? Why? Yeah, what, it's weird. What, what, have, what, what have I done apart from <laughs> everything? You know, yeah. as, as, as a, a cis white thing male. around in the world. Yeah, and I to- I totally bear that responsibility, of course. But um, you know, I-, I I don't necessarily. Oh God, I sound like fucking Bolstrek saying I don't want Doctor Who to remind me of what a gobshite I am by <laughs> proxy. You know, I mean, it reminds me of how much a gobshite I am by the way that I react to the episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else? Anything else that I liked about this? I like the whole scene when they're having that um, dialogue with the Harmony Shoal bloke over the diamond, yeah. you know, that's very reminiscent of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom at the start when they've got that, that yeah, whole scene. Yeah. And throughout that whole bit, all I could think of, my God, that actor, his his vocal cords must be fucked at the end of it. Yeah, because, big time. You know, he's, doing, he's got a bit of a Papa Lazaro voice going on there. <laughs> Hello, uh, oh, Hello, fuck. Not even going to bother. Dave. Have you got the diamond for me, Dave? <laughs> I got some pegs for your for your diamond. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, uh, uh, he was cool. I like I like the harmony show thing. But immediately I was like, hasn't Stephen done this before? Is this him nicking ideas from himself? And then I realised, in an episode's time, obviously they come back. They come back, yeah. And then I was thinking of uh, the colony Saf dude. Oh and yeah, he's like. His head that twists is oh that's a bit of a Stephen thing is he likes you know stuff that happening sort to of people's body horror sort kind of stuff of, isn't it yeah. yeah and then obviously through all of this you've got a dismembered head being carted around and then various yeah. people getting their heads chopped off and on so you know from a perspective of Doctor Who's got to be spooky and it's got to scare the kids for Christmas Day that's yeah. pretty strong yeah definitely um what did you think of Greg Davies in this. So I will I will not say that he was miscast because I don't think that's the right way of putting it. But yeah. I think he should have been given a crazy mohawk, and I think that he should have had a facial tattoo, mm. and because he just looks like someone's da. He doesn't look like <laughs> King Hydroflex, the blah 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 of the muncher of the blah 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 war. You know, yeah. it's like uh, you know he's he's fine, but. It does sort of, I don't know, did, were they sort of like, if we make him up too much and he's just a disembodied head, people won't realise it's Greg it Davis. Is. Yeah. So maybe they were like, oh, we need to kind of keep him as he is. Or maybe he didn't want to, you know, he's already, I've got my hole through a a, a desk for most yeah. of, yeah. you know, my head sticking out through this thing for most of the episode. So 
I kind of get that. But I just wish that, if they'd gone it, a little got, bit. They got one of Britain's tallest men. And then <laughs> most of the story, he is probably sat down <laughs> on, his or knees. on his knees. Yeah, with his head popped through the desk. Poor guy. Oh, I mean, obviously, we were, pr- we were present at the recording of this story um, mm. way, way back when. Uh, we visited this the TARDIS set. This isn't like set. the ninth time we brought this up. There should be a bingo card. How many times have we brought <laughs> yeah, up we were on the TARDIS set? Um, and of course, we saw the hole in the console. Um, Peter Capaldi, you know, very enigmatically put his fist through it and said, you may have noticed there's a hole in the console. And maybe that's for something coming up very soon. Um, or whatever he said. It's on my maybe, channel. Maybe he said something like... Uh, uh, maybe somebody's head could fit here, or something yeah. like that. You know, maybe just the right size for someone's head. Or maybe, or maybe it's a glory hole for a rato. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's in you. <laughs> um, After Clara yeah. goes, the doctor goes on a bit of a bit of an odd one. Goes through all the exes. <laughs> He's lonely. Oh, well, it was interesting. We were talking about that when we did um, uh, Hell Bent, like. Clara and the 12th Doctor love each other? Is that like yeah. a, what did they say to each other? All that sort of stuff. It'd be interesting yeah. to go back and watch more of that tenure and mm. follow that. Piece it all through, together. Actually. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, he does. I think he does. He does love her. Yes, in the, yes. In the way, and I think this is something that I do like with this story, that the idea that the way that the Doctor loves his companions you know, it is not the love that we understand as human beings. Obviously, this is what River is saying, isn't she? That, you know, how 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 can this being love little old yeah. me sort of thing? Um, which I like. I do appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, there's some there are some nice moments in it. I would be I would be, you know, remiss if I did not say that there were elements that weren't worth you know talking about. So what did you think of Greg Davis? What did I think of Greg Davis? Kind of wasted, really. Um, but then again, I've never really thought much... I think really he's in much, it enough. He's in it enough. But then again, I mean, I've never really thought much of him as an actor. I love him as a comedian. Um, mm. But I've never I've never watched any of his shows, like his his scripted stuff, and I've never really enjoyed it. You know, I mm. he did that show with Rick Mel and... Never really. I was going to say, there's one or two lines in this where he's definitely channeling Rick. Yeah. Um, you can see it in his face because he was such a fan of his. And, yeah. you know, he takes after him in terms of his comedy. He's admitted as much, like mm. his facial expressions and his yeah. delivery. There are a couple of lines where I was like, oh, this part is made for Rick. You know, yeah. it's like if you got the Rick from those Bombardier beer adverts yeah. and put him yeah, yeah, in yeah. this, he would be pitch perfect for this part. Yeah. Yeah, he would have been great. Uh, and, you know, it's just still a tragedy, isn't it, that Rick Mel never got to, to be in Doctor Who. Even if he'd and have can even you imagine done it. all the stuff with Alex <laughs> Kingston saying, all those nights of passion? Oh, you yeah, know, yeah. It would have been magic. <laughs> yeah, I think that would have been it. I think that would have elevated it just enough for me to have been like, oh, well, this is fine because this is Rick Mel. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, talking of wasted, though. Should we talk very, very briefly about Matt Lucas? Because yes. I remember when we reviewed Husband's River Song, obviously we didn't know that he was going to come back for Series 10. No. Um, I didn't know he was going to come back for Return of Dr. Mysterio. No, um, yeah. But I think I remember saying that, that it's a shame his mark on Doctor Who is being in this one shitty part where he was kind of wasted. Yeah. Um, I mean, crazy to think how wrong I was considering this would be the first of many appearances. But I think he is used well considering... This isn't the last time we see him, but probably underutilized in yeah. isolation. Yeah, um, he's an odd character, isn't he? Really, because of his the, his persona shifts quite dramatically between this story and the next time we see him. You know, he becomes far more grounded from the next story onwards. Um, I mean, he works he works well in this as you know the the comedy sort of funny man to I mean it's not even like a double act with the doctor there is elements of that um but just a sort of like the sniveling sidekick he he mm. t- he, wor- he works well um do you I mean, think I- he was brought back maybe because he worked well with peter or there was a good cuz they do seem to have something got, on screen 
yeah, in that in that whole scene where you know, like you said about oh, you know, stop crossing your arms. I can't, I can't. I've got cross arms. You know, that whole scene, that exchange, that works really well between the two of them. So I wonder if it and was that. Is that. The Nardole we see really isn't it later down the line. Yeah, um, you know, and I think Matt Lucas, you know, he he reduces, you know, he's a bit more like this, isn't he, in this story? And then I think he, uh, sort of yeah. re- he, he reduces, he pulls back on that because I guess you couldn't have too much of that in the the main show if when he's anyone's ever seen his silent comedy show Pompadour which has Alex McQueen big finish master oh, yeah. as right. his as his butler um it got panned but it's you know it, it, it's like six episodes and it's him trying to do silent comedy thing but yeah. this is like Pompadour Matt Lucas playing Nardole here versus i guess actory Matt Lucas I've never really seen him do anything beyond you know I like it you know, that's kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. And being in, on the Bake Off. <laughs> being on the Bake Off, yeah. Um, no, I don't know if I've ever seen him do any, you know, serious stuff. I think he did Les Mis on Broadway he did, for a he while. Did, he did do Les Mis. Um, but again, even that part, although it's like, you know, it is in, a, a, a sort of horrible, insidious part. It is a comic part as well. So, right. you know, he is, he's still okay. playing playing t- to type a bit i guess um yeah i don't i, I don't know uh, i i certainly i th- probably because i knew where nardle was going i think i probably didn't mind him anywhere near as much this time round. um i yeah, liked the I, scene of him being held at gunpoint by his own body oh yeah I that was that good bit. yeah because that that's that quite fun. horrible you know like he's got yeah. no control over because the baddie of this story Greg Davis is kind of the secondary villain. Like the mm. the big bad is the big the soup, lumbering robot creature. Yeah. Um, which I think is dispatched pretty poorly because it, like the, the doctor uses the credit that Harmony Shoal lot gave him. Yeah. Uh, gave them to pay for the diamond in uh Greg Davis's head, which just as a quick sideline, we're getting very sidetracked. But I you know, Stephen Moffat, I, I get that you probably watched um, the world is not enough before writing this, but you didn't need to make it so fucking obvious. <laughs> you have a scene with a hologram where they look at the projectile embedded in his head. Oh, yes. And then you do a bit later on where you say he's it's it's still moving in his head and yeah. it's getting closer and closer to a point where he will end up dying. Yeah. Um, it, it was just a bit like, oh, oh, all right, you know, there's, there's influence <laughs> and then there's fucking ripping off like straight out of a Bond movie. Um, but... Yeah, uh, th- th- that that was really weird. He like puts the credit ball yeah. in the neck hole of the robot <laughs> and then says, "You're absorbing all of the different markets and uh, you know, he got killed by the f- <laughs> yeah. yeah, he got killed by the FTSE 100 and it's like, oh, yeah. oh, great, you know. So what? Uh, it was a bit of a lame ending. Yeah. And then for for them to end up as bloody butlers on the uh on oh, I know. But I think that's just it's Christmas Day. You can't kill everybody off. I mean, they've no. already had their heads oh, no, no, severed no, from their bodies. No, you know, but but I mean, I I think is is that more of an indignity that you know they he, you know these poor I'm trying to actually like get, get them a body, Doctor Who. Don't um don't <laughs> just say like, well, I'll just punk you here and you can just uh, be the. Well, he doesn't D. mind doing it. He doesn't mind doing it to Ramon. I think his name is because. Oh yeah. I mean, he's just there to make him feel jealous. So it's like the Doctor saying, "Yeah, what could, what can you do to River when you're just a head." You know, yeah. The, um, well, um, <laughs> that's, that's not. Uh, don't, yeah, don't, go on. Don't say, say that Stephen Moffat will be there uh, furiously typing. When he writes his one episode for a series, I can't remember which one it is now. Anyway, um, <laughs> yes, let's let's not. Uh, yeah, were you going to say something there before about Greg or or Matt Lucas? No, no. Um, uh, before, I mean, I guess we'll talk about Derillium. And that whole yes. thing. But before we get into that, uh, a few little uh, a production error that I noticed oh. whilst watching this story, um, which I guess, I mean, is, well, it is a production error. So when the ship is crashing and they have that whole bit with the TARDIS and uh, he teleports her to the TARDIS, she parks the TARDIS in, on the deck of the ship, uh, the flight deck. And then he goes inside and all that kind of stuff. And then they decide, actually, this ship is not worth saving. Let's just get in the TARDIS and we'll be fine. Yeah. 
uh, which is quite nice, um, seeing as they are, it is a spaceship full of bloody mass murderers and crooks. Um, when they go inside, we get a shot from inside the TARDIS, just of the doors. So they run in and they shut the doors behind them. The windows of the TARDIS are boarded up. Oh. And I was like, what? Why? They've got just white wood over the top. I was like, that's weird. And then I realised what they must have done is, um, rather than shoot it on the console room set, they had the prop TARDIS on the set of the flight deck. And they must have said, let's take the back wall out of the police box prop. And we'll shoot it that way. But of course, the police box prop doesn't, has got this board behind the glass to illuminate Mm. the windows. So I was like, ah, only a, a sad git thing to notice. I think you can also see a few it's like just... cable. You see a few cables as well trailing down right. where Peter is. And you're like, oh yeah, you shouldn't be seeing that stuff. That's uh, that's like turning the, that's turning the lights on. What what I think happened here is that Matt enjoyed it a lot more than he thought he would, and he's just finding things to <laughs> pick holes in. <laughs> and then and then when they land on Derillium uh, at the restaurant, um, they they I shoot. I like that whole bit. Yeah, that's great. It's lovely. They shoot that whole scene outside the console room set. Ah, so they just put the drapes up. They put the drapes around the the outside of the console room, just around the doors. Yeah. Uh, And that way you get the better perspective of the... the, And I guess it only needs to be a small set, doesn't it? The restaurant. Exactly. I I, I like that whole bit where, you know, he lands on the planet, gets in the TARDIS, zooms ahead a little bit. Yes. The guy with the hard hat comes along. He gives in the diamond. You should build a restaurant here. Yeah. Gets in, flies to the date where it's open. Uh, sorry, we're booked up for four years. Puts yeah. the date in. And then it's very curse of fate or death, that, isn't it? It's very like I broke cur- the architect first. Very um, much so. Um, no, I like that's that. great. And I like the way that whole scene is shot and scored where, you know, yeah. he's he's going back to the console and checking on River and then, parking the handbrake and then walking yeah. to the door and then coming back again. I, yeah. I, lo- I liked that whole sequence. I thought it was beautiful. And then, of course, it leads into the 24 years on Derillion bit, which yeah. um, we'll get to comments from Rodders in, in just a second about what they thought of it. But that scene is is mentioned constantly in the comments about, you know, w- what a striking moment it is and, you know, yeah. one of the, the, the more touching moments, certainly from this era of the show, but pr- from the program generally. Uh, yeah. Did you say that Annie got a bit teary-eyed towards the end? She did, yeah. She got teary-eyed. Uh, and I, I went, oh, come on. Put yourself together. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, she she did get a bit teary-eyed. And, I mean, and then it is lovely. But, I mean, I just don't think... I have never been able to connect particularly strongly to that relationship. So it doesn't mm. quite have the same effect on me. Um you know, if it was like the Doctor and Rose, I'd probably be, be blubbing myself. But um, I never quite felt the same thing with those two. Um, what about you? Did you shed a tear or were you stony hearted like me? No, I thought it was touching. I didn't feel yeah. overly about it. You know, yeah. I, 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 I liked it for the sentiment that it's it's romantic and it's touching. It's not red hot and raunchy with a couple of sizzling <laughs> gypsies thrown in. You know, it's like pretty... <laughs> It's 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 tame, you know, mm. like it's um, but it's very sweet. Yeah. And you know, when he says, you know, a, a night lasts twenty four years, and her reaction to that is 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 lovely. Yeah. Um, you know, she's like all of the bonking we're gonna do, my love. Um, <laughs> and cause, well, so I assume that's all they do for the next twenty four years. That's kind of the insinuation. I guess, she's like, I guess so. you know, we've got. We've got one more night left together. This is the last night we spend together. What yeah. else does that mean? You know, like yeah, yeah, that's yeah. just twenty-four years of constant shagging. Um, <laughs> so I, I like that. I do have to say, I, I love the sentiment of um, happily ever after, and yeah. that whole thing of we lived happily. You know, yes. forever doesn't mean anything. You know, yeah. as long as we're living happily in the moment, that's all that counts, and that's yeah. all that matters. But I think it is undercut, or I don't know what the right word is. I think it's slightly ruined by that caption at the end. Because, you know, you get that, and they lived happily ever after caption Mm. at the end where it gets blown away by the snow. And I just thought, I got it when you said it. I didn't need to see that because that jolted me out of it. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's a TV show. You know, when Doctor Who does stuff like that, I'm not adverse to it, but it does remind you, it takes you out of the. 
it goes a bit meta in that way, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I thought, you've made your point. You don't need to hammer it home. It was lovely as it was. So I thought that was slightly ruined. It's like, just in case everybody in row Z did get the point that we were making. Yeah. I mean, now, it was interesting, actually, when that caption came up, because I was reminded of a rumour on Gallifrey Base that came out. Can you remember this? And I don't know if, you know, people in the comments might be able to spread some light on this. Um, spread some light? Shed some light. Wow, mixed metaphor there. Um, <laughs> can you remember the rumour that was, this was potentially the last episode of Doctor Who? that there was some uncertainty within the BBC about whether or not Doctor Who would carry on in the way that it had been produced. And there was this idea that they would drop Peter, I guess potentially drop Stephen, and change the way that they produced it entirely. And the idea was that they would do a series of specials and each special would have a big celebrity name as the incumbent doctor. Can you remember this? That is ringing a bell. Uh, but yeah. I do remember going through the research for this earlier. Yeah. Part of that private eye report was that there were going to be a series of specials following this. Right. And that, I don't know if it was private eye that reported it, but it looked like the rumour at the time was that the BBC wanted to get shot of Stephen. Yeah, but I I don't know. I you know, God knows if that's true. It probably isn't, um, because he was making them an awful lot of money between Doctor Who and Sherlock. Yeah. Um, but I can see this as being a finale for, I mean, certainly for River Song's character. But I could also see it as being a finale for the Twelfth Doctor. So that doesn't surprise me. Although I don't yeah. totally buy it. You know. Yeah, it was a, it was a weird one, and you, I and I wonder if it is that thing of just like oh this pe this is people retrospectively speculating just because of that end caption, and we all live you know and they lived happily, so who knows? But I thought people it was who are in the know, you know that our our DMs are open and that, that we are safe. <laughs> we do not leak stuff on this channel, so you know just yeah. let us know what was going on. <clears throat> um, yeah, but otherwise. I, I, I liked the stuff at the end. Uh, yeah, it was it was sweet. It was the it was the it's the highlight of the story for me. I think that that last moment, and I'm sure that's the same for a lot of people. Um, I don't know if you want to tell me what people on Twitter had to say. I was just about to say on that. Let's turn to Twitter. Uh, Ellie Tardis Monkey, friend of the show. Yeah, uh, underrated Christmas classic that has a strong love and heartfelt ending. It sums up the perfect pairing of River and the Twelfth Doctor. Again, friend of the show, David Burgess, I was having a good Christmas until I had to sit and watch this. Uh, Chris <laughs> Topher, absolutely love it. Uh, Captain Dylan Hunt, uh, that would have been a perfect series finale or The Doctor and the Widow and the Wardrobe, either one. I don't know what you're smoking, Dylan, but can you please let me know? Uh, James at What Is That? I actually quite enjoy this one. The moment where River realizes 12 is the Doctor is fantastic. I agree. I think yeah, that's beautiful. That is and lovely. I love the way that it's kind of threatened that they're going to tell her that, you know, she's going to find out before she realizes. And I yeah. love the fact that Stephen just lets that bit unfold and she finds out naturally just by looking at him. And yeah. it's that kind of, oh, there is a real bond here. Like she just needs to look at his face and know, yeah. you know, that's, that's it. It's him. I, I love that. Um, in general, I think she works quite well with 12 and I wish they got more time together. I agree, James. Uh, Byron Davis, uh, the husband's river song is a hilarious over the top farce that has been laughing the whole way through. Capaldi and Kingston play off each other marvellously and the whole romp is tied up beautifully with that touching final scene. Not a perfect ep, but too fun to hate, especially for Christmas. Uh, ben Lewis, as a river song not fan, I was apoplectic with rage when they announced her return for this. To this day, I can't believe that it ended up being one of my all-time favourite episodes. Wow! Uh, and finally, from Lucas, quite possibly one of the worst Christmas specials, if not episodes. Gosh, Everything okay. annoying about River is in this. The writing is poor. You don't care for any of the characters. Waste of Greg Davis as a guest star. Only standout moment is when 12 reacts to the TARDIS, and that's it. But I tell you what, scrolling through, it is either... I love this or I hate this. Yeah. Um, 
it's, and it's a, that it's doesn't a Marmite shock one. me. No, yeah, that doesn't shock me. But I, I am glad to see that those two schools of thought that I've existed in, one being this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me personally, and it was a personal <laughs> attack on me, and then uh, coming back to it now and going, ah, oh, you know what? That was great. Um, I'm glad that I, I'm not alone in those two very different schools of thought. But it's yeah. just a it's an evolution of of taste and you know, the way you look at things and, and maybe not taking things so seriously anymore. We could all learn a lesson about that, I suppose, especially around Christmas. Um, yeah, and, and I think it's yeah. easier to evaluate it with distance from from the era as well, you know. I, I mean, I think mm. I think when you're, when, you know, we, we've said it several times that this whole era, we're not quite 100% on board with anyway. So I think when you've got, you've got that hanging over your head, already and you're sort of you're almost sort of building yourself up to be disappointed a bit aren't you because if you feel a bit let down already by other things you know as soon as there's that element where you don't like something then the, then the whole you know thing of cards comes crashing down and you're just like oh well then i hate this um i mean i i don't know if i'm necessarily i if i aggressively hate it as much as i once did um as a bit of christmas fluff i think okay it's fine it's it's probably still one of the weaker christmas specials for me i do think russell probably does christmas specials slightly better um i definitely think you know when we watched uh christmas invasion a few years back but then obviously we did um runaway bride last year didn't we you know i, I think i had more of a fun time with those um mm. Yeah, I don't I don't know. It's it's a funny one, but hey, it's a Christmas special at the end of the day. And that's all that matters. It's about a season of good cheer, perpetual hope, um, and <laughs> arguing with complete strangers on Twitter by the looks of it. Anyway, yeah. um we hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Review of Death, uh, yeah. a Doctor Who podcast. Uh I won't do all the spiel because that is Matt's remit. Uh but I would like to say, um, it's not the last episode of the year, but I think we'll no. probably be quite heavily focused on uh, the church on Ruby Road when it comes out. So yeah. um, I would just like to say on a personal note, thank you to everybody who has listened to, watched, commented, yeah. subscribed, rated, shared the podcast in 2023. Obviously, yeah. it was a big sea change with me moving to New Zealand, but um, between the stuff we've been doing on Patreon and the stuff we've been doing um, on the regular podcast. Uh, it's been a joy and it's, it never stops being a joy. So thank you all for, for kind of keeping, um, keeping it going because we do it for the love of it and we do it because we get to hang out, but yeah. you know, it's always nice to see the, how the, it's received yeah. on the other side of things. Definitely. You know, I just, yeah, I echo everything you said and yeah, just a, a huge thank you everybody. And yeah, Thank you for sharing it and liking it because that obviously helps us a lot. I mean, it gets more people watching it, uh, which is always nice um, and more people interacting. And it's always lovely to see your comments, uh, whether you agree with us or don't or do disagree with us. You know, it's always good fun to see what other people think. Um, yeah. So thank you, everybody. And thank you to everyone who signed up on the Patreon because that is amazing. Um, I know we just hit 300 wow, uh, oh my God. paid patrons on the platform, which is nuts. Um, We've got lots of plans for 2024. We're going to yeah. start our Red Dwarf stuff. We're going to start our Bond stuff. Obviously, we've still got all our Doctor Who nonsense going on over there as well. Yeah. Um, but there's a huge back catalogue. We've said it before. We plug it a lot. But yeah. it is, I think, definitely worth worth the investment of, of going over and having a look at least. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot to enjoy there if you, if you enjoy the podcast um, anyway. Um, yeah. And I, I think we said this when we recorded our last one, the Patreon stuff seems slightly more um x-rated <laughs> yeah no holds barred maybe in certain too respects. hot for tv too hot for tv too hot for youtube um yeah you know we we we, we do go a bit bit bonkers on that uh we don't get anything we... out but you know no no not yet anyway <laughs> not yet once the once the Patreon numbers start dipping, we'll we'll, we'll become desperate. Yeah. yeah, we'll be the 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 Rod Rod O F Rod O F Rod of. Um. 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, thank thank you everybody for that. Uh, and you know, again, if you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your grandparents, tell your pets. You know, we want you know. We're, we've 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 had a quite a good run lately with the new series. Oh my god! Through we've, November, we've, yeah, like basically, it, there's no point saying you're fortnightly home for Doctor Who news and reviews. We've been yeah. out here, bro, and you know, between the Patreon and obviously the regular show, it's been a busy November, and we're yeah. looking forward to seeing what 2024 brings. Obviously, so keep an eye out on socials for upcoming plans. We've got the Roddies coming up in the new year. I'm sure yes. we'll do a, a little run through of. Doctor Who in, in 2023 and, and the yeah. review of death in 2023 as well. Yeah, that'll um, be a big there's, one there's as well. Lots, it will be a big one. There'll be a lot to discuss there. Yeah. Um, your favourite instalment of Doomsday. Any, anybody? Hello? Hello? <laughs> um, I completely forgot that happened. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, wow. We'll get I'm right sure, into it. We'll give I'm, it its, it's uh, two cents, you know. I, I'm sure by the time we c- get to actually recording the Roddies, I will have forgotten Doomsday again. And I'll be like, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So there we go. Thank you, everybody, uh, for, for supporting us this year. It's been absolutely incredible. And mm. uh, we will join you again, like Billy said, before Christmas, well, not before Christmas, but over the before Christmas the period, uh, before the new year, uh, to talk about the church on Ruby Road. Shooty Gat was first proper story as the Doctor, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, and obviously, I'm sure we'll be singing the Goblin song uh, in perpetuum. Uh, I'll leave that, that to you. Uh, leave it to me all right okay uh, i'll try and learn the words so that when we do the church on ruby road i'll, I'll come in singing i'll put a blonde wig we will on try as well. and open with it i think should we try and open yeah. the podcast with it <laughs> um yes so thank you all have a very merry christmas and happy holidays and have a nice break from the usual dirge of <laughs> real life <laughs> <laughs> life <laughs> yeah uh right we'll see you then take care bye-bye bye bye